Hello, everybody, and welcome to this Ask Me Anything or AMA about Google's cloud or Google's AI roadmap. And we're going to be talking about AI on cloud, on TensorFlow, on Android, or whatever your questions will lead us to. So I'm Lawrence Moroni. I'm a lead on the TensorFlow team, like specializing in open source machine learning. Hey, I'm Dale. I'm an applied AI engineer at Google Cloud. Hey, everyone. I'm Carl, and I'm also a developer advocate, and I focus on helping customers do AI on the cloud. So given that we have some cloud superstars with us, I see we've got plenty of cloud questions. And don't forget, if you have questions of your own, take a look on the right-hand side of the window. You'll see a little QA icon if you're registered. Click on that, and you'll be, able, you'll be taken to the question and answer sheet. So please enter your questions there, and we'll do our best to get to them. So with no further ado, let's get to our first question. And it's from Stephanie. And Stephanie asks, how can the cloud help with machine learning? It's like I was just waiting for somebody to ask that question. Uh, <laughs> there, there are so many ways the cloud can help with ML. Uh, a lot of the ways are the way cloud helped with lots of different types of software development. Like it's easy to have a consistent environment for all your developers. You can do work not on your local PC. Everything's more repeatable, scalable, yada, yada, yada. But for me, and I'm sure you guys feel this way as well to some degree, I think that like note, uh, prototyping notebooks like Jupyter Python notebooks in the cloud have made a huge difference in the progress of ML. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think we could spend the whole episode talking about this question because we're all geeking out about it, right? How about you, Carl? Any any areas where you think it could help? Yeah, I think uh, Dale mentioned uh, the notebooks, which are a great start. But also, one of the coolest things I'm working on now is pipelines, which is this ability in the cloud to connect a whole bunch of different services together, like extracting data, building a model, deploying a model. And basically, it's like hitting the play button, making sure it works the same every time and tracking it. So Nice. Nice. And, and for me, I actually really love the fact that you got like hosted GPUs and hosted TPUs in the cloud, like with uh, Colab notebooks, as uh, Dale was mentioning. And I, how many times have you tried to configure your GPU or maybe there's a new shipment of drivers for your GPU and now suddenly it doesn't work with your framework and you got to do all this kind of twiddling. But when I can offload that to a cloud workload and just have GPUs work so I can train quickly, it just it makes me happy. So shall we move on to our next question? And the next question comes from Light. And Light asks, what tools does Google offer to help with ML ops? I can start with that one. Uh, I see a lot of customers, they start with a notebook, like Dale mentioned, which is basically a virtual machine. They're able to do all kinds of things within that virtual machine. You know, They can train models. But they can sometimes run up against some limits where they say, well, you know, uh, I need a better machine, a bigger machine. And so uh, what they'll, they might do is you can upgrade to uh, all kinds of powerful machines with GPUs, et cetera. Then you might get to a certain point where you don't want to do your training within the notebook instance itself. And you can use our training service. And then what happens is customers start to actually take uh, the next stage uh, maybe building, like I mentioned before, a pipeline where you can bring everything together into a series of steps. Um, we might even see customers doing things like distributed training. If you're doing like a, a vision model or a natural language model where massive amounts of data and lots of training time can really help you, um, you can, you know, with a couple lines of code in TensorFlow, just using a distributed training strategy, you can work across a whole cluster. So uh, lots of different options. MLOps is really a journey. It's just about uh, applying some of those DevOps concepts to ML, and we've got all that on the cloud. Cool. Yeah, I can also add, Carl, you just talked about a bunch of reasons that this is really exciting for developers sort of from a devops -y perspective. But I think one of the things that's interesting about machine learning compared to more traditional development is uh, there's, there are all sorts of things you have to think about that are not just about how to train or deploy the model. Like, like for example, you could have a model that you deploy to the cloud. It predicts what the demand for a product is going to be, for example. Uh, and you don't change any of the code, and you don't change your model at all, but then it just becomes less effective because the world changes, and the data that your model is receiving changes. It's called drift. So it has nothing to do with the engineering. It has to do with the data. So part of ML ops are tools to say to basically monitor models and make sure that they're, they're making the predictions that we want. And if you want to do all of these things to make sure your model is behaving, it's really helpful if you have a a set of tools or a cloud provider that sort of gives you those things out of the box. 
and I, and I have to do a shameless self plug here as part of this because you know as Dale mentioned there's a whole universe of uh, things that you would need to do to be effective with MLOps so we've been working with the folks at deeplearning.ai to put together a uh, specialization and it's an MLOps specialization it's going to be taught by Andrew Eng it's going to be taught by Robert Crow from the TensorFlow team who's a TFX superstar and I'm going to be doing a little bit too uh, talking about hosting models and one of the nice things about that is you know you'll be able to learn from end to end all of the attributes of MLOps, avoiding the kind of drift that Dale was talking about, as well as like understanding the tools for building, monitoring, maintaining, deploying, and everything that you would need in MLOps. So I think, you know, there's there's just so much in that space that um, it, it takes time to learn it all. And, you know, we're really excited the fact that we have comprehensive offerings. I'll give a sec plus one to that recommendation. I think deeplearning.ai is an awesome research resource to learn about this stuff. Thank you. Thank you so much. So let's move to the next question. And it's from Max. And Max, I love this question. Max asked, in your opinion, what's the coolest thing that you're working on? And then in brackets that you can talk about. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. How about Carl? What do you think? One of the coolest things I'm working on now is around forecasting. Um, you know, on Google Cloud, we're offering a whole bunch of new capabilities around that. Um, and I actually published a blog post recently that allows you within a Google Sheet to select some numbers and simply forecast what's going to happen next. What I just think this is so cool, this idea of predicting the future, You know, taking any data and trying to understand what, what's going to happen next. Cool. That's so so that is really neat. And the fact that you can just do it in a sheet, right, without like any kind of background expertise, I think that will appeal to a lot of people. Uh, for me, I'm really excited on AI getting smaller. Uh, there's a lot of like uh, information and there's a lot of hype and there's a lot of great stuff out there around these gigantic models that only the likes of like a Google or other large companies could build. But my personal passion and I think the coolest thing that I'm working on is really getting AI to be much smaller and getting it into the hands of developers through TensorFlow Lite, through MLKit, through TensorFlow Lite Micro, and even and how Vertex and things in the cloud can help you with a neural architecture search to build the optimum model to be able to get it into the hands of people. Uh, you may have seen in the keynotes, uh, the main consumer keynote, for example, there was a dermatology app where it was a case of you can have this app that takes photographs of various lesions or various things on your skin, and it's been trained to determine if you really should be worried about this or not. And if you are, then to go see a dermatologist. Because uh, my daughter has worked in dermatology, and she's like, early access is the most important thing. Um, being able to get um, to understand what if there is a problem early is the most important thing to be able to avoid any potential problems. And being able to put this into an app where you can just take a photograph and then have a reasonable prediction that you know, you may have a problem, go see a dermatologist now, is something that really excites me. And there's just so many opportunities and there's so many things that can be opened there by making AI small so it will fit on devices and fit on like even embedded systems. I 100% agree with you, Lawrence. I think that this early diagnosis with ML stuff has huge potential uh, to make yeah. an impact. But uh, I'll, I'll take the I'll take the counter. <laughs> I'll say I'm really excited about these large models that don't fit on a microcontroller. Um, like for example, if you if you follow me at all on social media, I talk a lot about uh, GPT-3 or T5 or all of these big language models trained by Google that can generate text. Um, but they're big and they're cumbersome, and it's really hard to use them in an app. So what I'm excited about is taking a lot of these tools, putting them on Vertex AI, uh, and sort of hosting them in the cloud so that I can begin to use them on the edge and, and in my apps. Sounds good. And yeah, these models for generating text are so much fun. Uh, in in my courses, I taught how to a very simple uh, LSTM, and which was trained on traditional Irish songs, so that you could give it a seed text and it would come up and generate a traditional Irish song for you. And some of the some of the results were hilarious. And uh, I'd like to see when people do it properly how good these things are going to be. All righty. So um, let's think about whether were there any other cool things, or shall we move on to the next question? I think if we, if we don't move on, we'll be on this question the whole time. <laughs> I know, exactly, because I, I could geek out about this all day. So, OK, let's ask the next one is from Kai. And Kai asks, what are the tools and frameworks to help me solve computer vision problems? 
Uh, so let me start with that one because I, I love computer vision and I'm a computer vision geek. And uh, so, the, of course, the first tool and framework you should consider is using TensorFlow. And using TensorFlow, it's really easy for you with Keras to spin up convolutional neural networks, for example, to do image classification. It's pretty simple for you to do autoencoders or variational autoencoders if you want to generate graphics. And then there's generative adversarial networks that, you know, once upon a time, they, you needed a PhD and a, like a computer science department behind you to be able to build these, but now almost anybody can start looking at how to define generative adversarial networks and, and build them using things like TensorFlow and using the functional API in Keras. So, you know, I'd say that's a really, really good place for you to get start on computer vision problems. But then, of course, if you want to build a production system, if you want to build some great models using neural architecture search, we got this little thing called Vertex, right, Dale and Carl? <laughs> Yeah, so um, just to build on that, um, you know, what another option is uh, auto ML vision, right? So if maybe you're uh, you want to dabble in some models, but not necessarily write the code yourself, uh, as uh, um, Lawrence mentioned, you can basically take your own images and then say, what kind of problem do I want to solve? Is it classification? Like, I'm trying to figure out what type of image is this, or maybe even something like object detection, where you're trying to figure out uh, what are the bounding box around different uh, items in the picture. It can do that for you. And uh, it's a great way to sort of compare and contrast, you know, the custom trained models that you might build with TensorFlow and evaluate them, compare that, how's that doing against AutoML? So you can kind of see the baseline of performance that you're working with. Mm. I would also add, um, in the vision projects I've worked on, I think that the model building is is one complicated bit, or maybe it's getting easier. But I actually think the thing that, with, with all machine learning multimedia projects, one of the toughest things is not the machine learning part. It's like, well, how do you collect the images? Are they are they coming from a camera? Are they streaming? And how do, you know, how do I apply the, the model in this sort of this loop? I think that's actually really tough. And for me, one of the, the tool sets that makes this easier is TensorFlow.js. Uh, TensorFlow.js runs in your browser. And in addition to having lots of built-in vision models, it also has nice tools to like easily connect those models to your webcam or to your microphone. So highly recommend. Oh, definitely right. And you just inspired a thought in me. And that was, uh, we released a thing on uh, yesterday called Know Your Data. And this is a tool that really helps you when you've got your data to maybe understand any potential problems in your data and particularly in your image-based data. And like one little story about this was um, the getting data and getting good data for building computer vision classifiers can be difficult. So uh, for one of my courses, I created a data set using synthetic CGI and it was called Horses Are Humans, where I rendered like a few hundred pictures of humans, I rendered a few hundred pictures of horses. And it was much cheaper for me to do this than it would be to like hire a photographer and hire models and take pictures of them. And so I thought this would be a nice way of exploring using convolutional neural networks because CGI images have the same kind of features. And if it can learn features from a CGI image, it could be used with a real photograph. And it kind of worked, and it worked really well. But then I used this uh, Know Your Data tool that we released. And one of the things that I found that was really interesting was that when I rendered the humans, I rendered them of all different skin tones and multiple genders, multiple poses, multiple types of clothing, background and all of these kind of things. And I didn't realize that when I had done this, that in some of these images, particularly people with darker skin tones, that some models couldn't recognize their face. So even while I was explicitly creating data that was supposed to be diverse in nature, I ended up inadvertently creating data that was not diverse in nature. And so being able to use tooling like this to be able to solve computer vision problems, and one of the ways is, you know, you want to make sure that your data is correct. So whether you gather it from your webcam or whether you CGI it, uh, being able to use a tool like Know Your Data is really cool when you want to solve computer vision problems. All right, our next question <clears throat> comes from Wei. And Wei asks, can you explain how Vertex works with TensorFlow? And what's the relationship? <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, let me get started with that one. And I'm not a Vertex expert. I know it's Carl and Dale, but I'll tell you why I geek out about Vertex. And for me, with geeking out with Vertex is really the AutoML elements and the neural architecture search. Um, if you watch the developer keynotes that we had on two days ago, uh, we built a demo around comment spam detection. And this comment spam detection was, you know, we created a data set of comment spam. I used a TensorFlow Lite Model Maker to create a model to detect comment spam. And then another cloud superstar, Sarah Robinson, used Vertex 
to uh, do a neural architecture search on this text data set to have Vertex build a model for it. And of course, the model that was done using the neural architecture search in Vertex was far more accurate than my one. So I think, you know, this, this to me was a really cool way. And then Vertex could export this as a TensorFlow model or as a TensorFlow Lite model. And, you know, to me, that was one of the amazing touch points on it. And then, of course, with Vertex, you got all of the pipelining stuff that, you know, Dale and Carl were talking about earlier on. So I think, to me, that's one of the great things about how these are integrated with each other. But I'm not the expert. Dale and Carl, how about you? I, I think there are, there are a lot of ways that TensorFlow works with Vertex, but the two that come to mind are basically training and serving. So if you have a model you want to run on a GPU or you don't you want to run on your local machine for whatever reason, you can submit a training job to Vertex. And this also comes with other nice features like monitoring the training of the model and keeping track of versions and keeping track of what data set you use to train your model or the hyperparameters you use to tune your model. So there are lots of nice reasons to train a TensorFlow model in Vertex. Then when you want to use that model from your website or from a mobile app, you can uh, host it on Vertex so that it becomes this REST endpoint. You hit it from your app. Um, and that's really nice because it scales it's fast. Um, and it, even if you're not even if you're building your own TensorFlow model, this is something I love to do, you can find a pre-trained TensorFlow model, something from TensorFlow Hub maybe, drop it into Vertex's prediction service, and now you can call Bird or Inception or whatever uh, from your own REST endpoint. Cool. Absolutely. And just to build on what uh, Dale said, I mean, just think about how TensorFlow is woven into everything in Vertex, really. If you create a new notebook, literally the menu options give you a TensorFlow enterprise uh, instance where you've got all of uh, the TensorFlow packages pre-installed on there. Um, if you're going to use a training service, like Dale mentioned, one of the standard container images is for TensorFlow. So you don't have to build your own custom container. You literally take a little bit of your training code and uh, uh, it gets added to that uh, container and it runs on the cloud. So really pretty much every action you want to do on the cloud using TensorFlow um, has been streamlined, optimized, uh, things even like from a performance perspective. Um, there's uh, connectors between TensorFlow to Google Cloud Storage or to BigQuery. Uh, so we've done a lot of work to just make sure it's a very quick and easy experience using TensorFlow across the platform. Cool. Yeah, thank you. So the next question, it's kind of similar, uh, comes from Joe. And Joe was asking, what are the best ways to train a model if you're not a data scientist? What do we think of that one? The tool that I use constantly is uh, AutoML, which is now built into Vertex. So basically, the idea is use this tool all the time. So you upload your data set. You either have it labeled, you get somebody to label it. Then AutoML is basically this tool that will uh, train a neural network for you under the hood. And on top of that, it does a lot of optimization and neural architecture search to decide what the best, the most accurate model is. And it basically will produce for you this you know, high quality enterprise grade neural network. And you don't you really have to know nothing about machine learning in order to get this to work. Um, and then at the end, you can you can either use it right. Uh, it, will, it will either generate a REST endpoint for you, and you don't have to ever dive into the details. Or if you want that TensorFlow model because you want to use it in, in a mobile app or in TensorFlow.js, you can export it that way. So this is my favorite way to just quickly have a high-quality prototype. Sounds good. And I, there's a couple of other options that um, also to explore, not to sound like I'm not recommending Vertex, because I think Vertex is amazing. Uh, but if you were just starting with like open source, um, if you use a tool called TensorFlow Lite Model Maker, uh, the goal of TensorFlow Lite Model Maker is to reduce all of those hundreds of lines of code that you would need for managing data, defining a neural network, training that neural network, and evaluating it to usually just three or four lines of code in a few core scenarios, which are like text classification, image classification, classification, object detection, audio detection, and a few others. So if you just want to start fiddling with Python, uh, that's one great way to start. And then there's another thing that once you're defining your neural networks using TensorFlow, we have a hyperparameter search called Keras Tuner. And that's one of the nice things that if you're not a data scientist and you're not sure about what learning rate you should set or what optimizer you should choose, or should you have three hidden layers or two hidden layers or you know any of those kind of things that this actually does like this brute force search for you to find the best architecture against uh, like a uh, whatever parameter you want to set, like accuracy or training time or anything like that. And I find it really, really useful and helpful if you want to kind of put together a, a quick neural network without having that deep level of expertise. 
It's funny that you say that because I feel like when I first got started with machine learning, one of the things that like held me back or demotivated me was the fact that even if I built a model, like what if it wasn't the best model? Like, how will I ever know what number of layers to choose? So the hyperparameter yeah. tuning is, is key. Yeah. Machine learning imposter syndrome, right? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> you know? It's like, yeah, I, 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 when I had to learn to accept that I'm never going to build the best state of the art model, or if I did, I'm never going to be able to prove it. Uh, that was one of the biggest gateways and one of the biggest blockers that once that was out of the way, then I could really enjoy this field and get better at it. Cool. Uh, so really interesting question from Dean. Um, let's see if we can answer this one. I'm not even sure of the answer myself. So Dean asks, Google offers so many different options for ML. What platforms do we think will be well suited to exploratory model configuration and training for novel academic research? What do we think of that one? It's a, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to give my initial stab at that one, but I'd really love to hear everybody else's thoughts. And it, the idea is like for novel academic research, I think there's such a huge green field of things that are as yet undiscovered. And I think the ability to be able to have an open source model infrastructure and something like the Keras Tuner that I was talking about earlier on, so that you can start exploring some of the things that you would need to do to make a discovery and to be able to do research around that and still automate that. I think you know that's one thing that's particularly exciting. There's one thing that uh, we had questions earlier on about computer vision. And one part of computer vision that I'm fascinated with is image augmentation. So the goal here is that, you know, generally image augmentation is used to prevent overfitting. But when you have image augmentation, it's like things like, you know, rotating images randomly, changing contrasts, skewing, flipping, all of those kind of things so that you can artificially increase the size of your data set to avoid overfitting. But it's one of those areas where there's really very little research has gone into it to say, well, what's the optimal rotation? What's the optimal skew? And these kind of things. So being able to do that type of thing programmatically to be able to find results instead of you having to manually constantly do it is one area where I think, um, you know, the fact that TensorFlow is open sourced, the fact that there are tools like a Keras Tuner to be able to twiddle with your model like that, I think could lead to some novel academic research. Any other thoughts on that? Uh, I think, like, I kind of hinted at this earlier, but if you look at all of the things that have led to the recent advancement in ML, you think big data sets, you think compute. But to me, I really feel like what has made us come this far this fast are notebooks, are, are <laughs> notebooks where you can prototype, but more importantly, the ability to share them and have somebody be able to run your notebook in the browser without having to download anything or install anything, right? In science, it's about reproducibility. So I think that the fact that you know you can you can try something in a lab and send it to somebody else and they can get it running on their own machine is really powerful. So my answer is is, is Vertex notebooks and Colab notebooks. Very nice yeah. and uh, great great answers. Maybe just a couple other quick things to add. I think uh, uh, Dale raised a really great point about reproducibility. Uh, in, very important for academic research, right? It's not about submitting you know your accuracy number for a paper it's uh what environment did you use where's the code where's the data so some of the tools we talk about with like ml pipelines may seem like they're enterprise focused but those same capabilities uh that are needed to ensure that um a model that's used for the financial markets or healthcare is totally useful for uh, that kind of research. Uh, my other point is, I think, around the, the hardware that we have, right? So um, the ability to quickly spin up, um, you know, TPUs or some of the chips like the A100 chip. I personally done that where I was uh, building a language model and it was taking forever to train. And I just said, let me just change my configuration to an A100, um, cranked up the number of CPUs and memory, and my models were training so much faster. So, you know, in research, that quick iteration time is so important. And Google's um, open source uh, uh, integrations and, and ability to pull in all kinds of packages, I, I think, are a great way to get started in research. Yeah, and I, I have to also agree, and also particularly what Dale was saying about uh, notebooks. I mean, I can't emphasize that highly enough. And I have to tell a little story that a couple of years ago, um, I was speaking in Wales, and I met a university researcher there. And, you know, we were just chatting, and then I asked, like, what is the biggest problem you have in research? And is there anything that we can do to solve that? And he was researching uh, issues of health of the brain. And he told me it was access to a GPU. 
that his department only has budget to afford like several GPUs and they do a time sharing and it's like the GPU is on a piece of hardware under somebody's desk and he has it like on Tuesday afternoon and if on Tuesday afternoon he's going to this desk and he's working on his code lab and then he oh not his code lab sorry he's working on his code and then he's like running his code and then he hits a bug and he runs out of time he has to wait until the next Tuesday to get access to this GPU and I took out my phone and I opened Colab in my phone and I showed him hey look GPUs in the cloud for free and the, the poor man's head nearly exploded because he wasn't really aware of this and um, it was like this changes everything that sometimes like you know smaller universities or smaller research institutes that don't have the resources of the of the giants that to be able to give them even simple things like access to a GPU and wait till he hears when I tell him they can get access to TPUs uh, you know it's like I find that's amazing so yeah notebooks in the cloud are more than just convenient coding in the browser it was all that back-end infrastructure that can I think can unlock a lot of academic research so yeah great question and some great points thank you let's move on to the next question and I love this one. It's from Mattia. And Mattia asks, what tools would you suggest to understand why an ML model, aside from hand debugging, does not work as expected? That's a good one. Well, one so, thing I can, oh, go ahead. No, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just going to start with, uh, it was something we haven't talked a lot about yet is uh, explainable AI. And uh, even if you're using AutoML, uh, you can take advantage of this. Uh, um, or you can basically create a model and see what the feature importances are, even for things like vision data um, or natural language uh, type of problems. So just an example, say you're building a vision model and uh, just the results aren't what you expect. And then you start looking at uh, what was the, what were the most important features? What determined whether something fell into class A or B? And you start to see maybe the highlighted part of the picture isn't what you expect. Maybe it's the background. Maybe when you took the pictures, there was some kind of skew in that some of pictures of a certain class were it, uh, taken at night and others during the day, for instance. So it was targeting the background, just a simple example. All kinds of things like that. Uh, you can actually figure out through using explainable AI to really drill down to understand why your model's making decisions. Great point. And so and there are things like available in TensorFlow. And if you're using the functional API in TensorFlow, you can start building things like uh, class activation maps. Uh, it's one of the things that I've been teaching in my recent courses around how to do this is to have that interpretable AI. And like a funny story around this is there's a famous uh, model, which is cats versus dogs that we've probably all done uh, when we're doing computer vision, where there's a data set of like several thousand cats and dogs, and you build a classifier to determine the difference between them. And when you're doing convolutional neural networks, you're thinking in terms of features, like um, what are the features in the image to determine a cat from a dog, like pointy ears on a cat, floppy ears on a dog, and all of these kind of things. Things. But when we started then doing the interpretable, interpretable code, effectively running the convolutions backwards to seeing what activated particular images to particular labels that we had written like thousands of uh, tests and you know we went through so many different neural architectures to tweak this and do this as accurately as we could and it ended up that the one key thing that told the difference between a cat and a dog were just the eyes and, and being able to do a class activation map just to highlight the eyes on all of these images was a great way to be able to debug and to see what like how the computer sees the images we've probably seen things like deep dream and all of that kind of stuff where where it's you know we it's done beautiful visualizations and crazy visualizations around that but when you roll that back to see how a computer sees something and having the code where you can just write and debug and step through it so that you can do these things like class activation maps um, it's a great way to be able to debug that it's working properly all right we are at two minutes so shall we take one more question or dale did you have something to add on that one? no no let's just do one more Okay, so uh, two minutes left. Our last question comes from Brett, and I love this one, which is, what are best practices for high-scale machine learning? Yeah, and I'll just kick it off. And, uh, you know, it's kind of similar to what I was saying before, where um, take advantage of uh, distributed training would be one thing I would say, is um, it, it's become so easy in Vertex now, uh, when you're using the SDK to kick off, let's say a training job, literally all you have to say is, the number of replicas, and it's going to set up um, this cluster for you. It's going to run the job in the cloud. Um, you know, there's there's a number of other things you'll want to consider. Um, things like you know, looking at the 
I/O, um, you know, using Google Cloud Storage probably for you know vision and uh, text models, maybe BigQuery. Um, but I'll just kind of start there, just saying distributed training using our training service. What other folks think? Yeah, I would also say like the, the training strategy is one part, and then oftentimes you would also be thinking about how you're preparing a really huge data set to enter a model. So for example, maybe you want to do a MapReduce or a Spark just to just take this huge data set and put it into the format that your model expects. Yeah, that's yeah, great stuff. There's, I mean, we could talk about this all day, unfortunately, but we are out of time. So thanks everybody for watching this, uh, for watching our AMA. If you've got any questions for me or for Carl or for Dale, you can find us on Twitter. We'll also be opening it in the comments below this video once IO is done and we'll be monitoring this and we'll try to answer all of your questions. Thanks uh, those of you who've asked questions and we weren't able to get to, I'm really sorry. And I just want you to enjoy the rest of your IO. Thanks so much.